Welcome. Welcome. Thank you uh, for coming to our session, Workshop C, uh, on social media. We've got a great panel, uh, which I will briefly introduce. We've got Christoph Folchett, who's the founder of TalkWalker. TalkWalker are the gold sponsor for uh, all of the sessions this morning, so we all uh, owe them a, a, a big thank you and perhaps a quick round of applause for TalkWalker. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, we've got Meredith Stevens, who's the Director of Digital Strategy at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, which is a contractor to the beef checkoff. Um, and we also have Kimberly Mackey, who is Corporate Vice President, Chief Communications Executive at Bright House, Bright House Networks. So thank you to the panel uh, for, for joining us. I'm Richard Bagnall. Um, I'm CEO of Prime Research UK, uh, and I also chair Amex Social Media Measurement Group. So what we're going to do today, uh, I'm going to just take us through a few slides where I'm going to look at some of the highlights that have come out of the uh, Amec World Media Intelligence Insights Study. This is a study that we do amongst our members. It was conducted in March, April of this year. Uh, we had an 80% response rate, 90 different companies, and it's, it's conducted at MD and CEO level, um, asking about their business and the trends that they see. So out of that big report, uh, it should have been sent to all members. You should have received it in the last few days. It's a, it's a member benefit. Out of that big report, I've looked at some of the highlights from social media, and I'm going to uh, put some of them up there to prompt a bit of discussion. Um, and then we're going to have a chat with the panel. We've also got two, uh, two people who represent in-house organizations, and of course, Christoph, who uh, is a provider of a, a social media monitoring and, and analytics service and, and platform. Um, I'd really welcome questions. We can do questions as we go. If you'd like to ask a question, please bung your hang hand up and I'll, I'll pause for it. Because I'd like it to be as interactive uh, as possible, but also questions at the end, of course, too. Um, those of you who uh, came to this session last year in Amsterdam might remember this slide. This is uh, how it was last year. And we asked ourselves this question. Um, this is the percentage of clients, of AMEC member clients, uh, that are including social media. And what we'd seen was uh, rapid growth. It had, it had, it had doubled in size um, for a number of years, uh, but then had basically pretty much plateaued. Uh, and we had a little talk about why that might be and what we could do about it and whether it would, it would continue to um, grow. And I know you're all holding your breath, wondering what this year's figure is. Um, and this year's figure is that it has basically stayed very level. So 45% uh, of our clients uh, are now including social media. Um, as a service, it's remained level. So, so why is this? Well, I guess there's a few reasons. One, um, percentages are easy to grow from a small number base, and as the numbers get bigger, it gets more difficult. But I don't think that, that explains it um, on its own. I think one of the reasons might be that a, a lot of our membership are the traditional analytics and the monitoring companies. And perhaps they're struggling a bit to get a relevant service um, in place fast enough for, 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 for clients. Um, if you can't do it yourself, perhaps you need to be working in partnership with providers um, that can. So perhaps the speed of adaption, the speed of, of partnership adoption um, might be another problem. But it, it, it's reflected by the next piece of data, which is that 48% uh, of our um, clients, according to our membership, um, are doing their own social media monitoring and measurement programs in-house. Now, these guys, these in-house companies, are not inventing their own social media monitoring service, so they must be buying it from somewhere. So I think there's a question there of where are they buying, buying it from. And of course, that could be non-AMEC members, uh, which raises a question for AMEC, but it also raises a question for us, because we don't want these type of organizations starting to sell services into our client base, which could frankly become uh, a competitive threat to us. And what was interesting on this was that 38% of our membership see this as an increasing trend as well. Um, so, so half of our clients are basically doing this stuff in-house, and we, we don't seem to be involved. So that might explain um, that first figure. Um, but where we are doing social media monitoring and analytics, uh, the companies that are doing it are seeing good, strong growth in their business that is selling social media. So nearly 50% of our members, uh, the number's actually 44 for those top two bars, uh, are seeing rapid rapid growth in their social media um, business. And 73% of us, so by far the majority, are reporting an increase in their social media business. So where we are selling social, we're selling um, more and more of it. Um, 
as we drill into our different members, obviously AMEC has different member categories. We have the specialist measurement and analytics providers, we have the PR agencies, we have in-house, uh, we have management consultants uh, and research firms. So are there any, any differences um, there? And I think what struck me here was that the year-on-year -year change um, between these three broad categories that I've put up here uh, is basically nothing. We're not seeing any, any difference year-on-year uh, in terms of the proportion. But what does stand out, of course, is the PR agencies. Um, 72, 73% of their clients are taking social media services. Um, whereas uh, the other members are down in the 30% in the region. So again, we should be asking ourselves, why is this? Is it because PR agencies are the trusted advisors and the consultants? and able to do the consultancy and deliver perhaps insights in a more tailored and relevant manner than um, what is perceived perhaps as vendors. So we need to be thinking about that. We've had a lot of comment uh, this morning and yesterday about, um, about this blend between data and, and consultancy. Um, drilling into it by regions, um, what we see here is that the, the biggest regions, first of all, uh, the, 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 the regions where they are selling the most social media is, is the US, North America, but also AMEC members that call themselves global. So uh, the, global, the global spread members are at 64%, North America at 56 basically very level. I don't think those changes in percents are statistically relevant. I think it's, it's, it's basically very, very level. But where we're seeing growth, perhaps unsurprisingly, Asia Pacific, Australia and New Zealand, that region, and also Central uh, and Eastern Europe, where we're seeing um, reasonably strong growth figures. So the next thing we looked at was the um, client demand and, and the change in client demand. So what are clients asking us according to the, 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 the bosses of our, of our members? Um, and, of course, clients are continuing to ask a strong growth in, in uh, demand for social and online media. Um, up at, the, up, at, up at the top there, we can see it. And again, you can see it's got a red arrow beside it because it's gone down a bit, but I, I don't think that's really um, particularly, particularly statistically relevant. Radio continues to shrink, which surprises me because radio, in terms of share of audience, certainly in, in many markets, continues to grow. But clients don't seem to be asking us to, uh, to monitor and analyse that. But I think particularly relevant to our social media thoughts and the way that the PR industry is changing is that um, the demand for clients for, for paid media and own media is growing. Um, and that, to my mind, um, is a great opportunity. However, when we look at what we're actually delivering, so this is the difference between this slide and the last one. The first slide was what are clients asking us. And this slide is what are we actually delivering. Um, we can see that um, own media and paid media um, are languishing down at the bottom. One's in a, in a downward um, decline and one's just is growing, but only by a tiny amount. So I really think there is an opportunity here. We keep hearing about integrated, um, integrated PR, integrated communications, how our client base is changing. I think it would make sense if we all gave a lot of thought to how we can maintain relevance by uh, helping them to monitor and measure um, across those sectors that matter to them. Um, all four of the top, the top categories here, of course, are continuing to see growth. Uh, interestingly, that TV is growing as well. I guess that's probably uh, driven by the uh, cheaper availability of, of TV content through digitized services these days. Uh, those of you who were in this morning's session with the uh, three global CEOs, they were talking about their... Um, research and development budgets and the amount of money I think we heard from John at Icentia that $10 million, which I think was 8% of, of, of his revenue, uh, was being invested in, in R&D. So what, what are our membership, not just those guys, the, the, the global AMEC membership, what are they intending to invest in over the next um, 12 months? And what you can see coming out at number one, and perhaps this is reassuring, is it is partnerships. So we need to operationalise, we need to get content quickly. I think we heard Peter Granite say it doesn't matter where content comes from as long as we have the content. So perhaps those partnerships with organisations maybe like Talkwalker to get that content and to, to be able to serve, um, to serve our client base. Number two, 
uh, user interface technology. So that's effectively portals. So I think there we've got, a, we've got a, an arms race in terms of people trying to develop smarter and better and uh, more, more um, interactive um, portals. But I think there is a, a question there because um, the world's not short of portals and dashboards and charts. What the world is short of is people who can interpret it and make sense of it uh, and bring insight to it and help people understand what it is that they're seeing. And that, of course, is number three, which is lagging, which is the um, insight consultancy skills. So it may be that that's perhaps a little bit out of balance. I don't know. I wonder what, what, what we think about that. Um, and again, we've heard about behavioral scientists and data scientists and the need for that. Well, that's languishing down... Um, I think number five there. Uh, still 50% of us or 49% of us intend to invest in that area, but it's much lower um, than some of the others. Um, and then finally, um, international expansion, right down less than a third of members. And you know, the, the, the theme of the summit is um, you know, local silo to, 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 to global. Um, we've seen how the global organizations are selling more social media, and yet we're not, not that many of our membership um, are thinking about globalization, it would appear, 30% of them. So those are some of the highlights that um, have come out of the uh, Insight study. It's, it's got about 70 pages. Um, it's a wealth of information that I'd really recommend um, you spend the time uh, to take a look through. Are there any, has anyone got any in, immediate thoughts on that before we move into the panel session and uh, dig a bit deeper into how these guys um, are sort of interacting with the information that we're seeing there? So we've got a question here, please. Thanks. Uh, Thomas, from the Hi, Thomas. existing um, evaluation standards and everything and it's, it, it, it sounds like a very straightforward thing but if if we think about the, the, the different types of social media that we're dealing with it doesn't look so straightforward any longer because integrating blocks um, as, as, as just a new evolving form of news media into, into evaluation content analysis is very straightforward but we've heard yesterday about you know the emergence of Pinterest and snap uh, you know snapchat and in Instagram and all these sorts of things partly I'm not even aware of, um, which, which, which follow you know, very different rules. And how do we, so how do we deal with those? And what's, what's our plan? And what's, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the bigger picture behind integrating that into evaluation? Yeah, well, I think that's a great question, Thomas. Um, this whole concept of what's called the dark web and the deep web, private messaging, is, is growing and growing. I think, again, was it Peter who talked this morning about a campaign um, on, on Snapchat that was being done? And when Snapchat's a private messaging service, um, how do we monitor and measure that? So rather than me asking that, answering that, I'm actually going to throw that to the panel. Does one of... Um, well, actually, before... I, we'll keep that question. I'll just quickly ask them to just introduce themselves, and then we'll go straight to that question. So, uh, Christoph, if you could tell us a little bit about you, about your company, uh, and then Meredith, and then, and then Kimberly, and then we'll go to that question. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Christoph Falchat, I'm founder at uh, Talkwalker. So Talkwalker, we are a uh, social data intelligence company, and we specialize in advanced social analytics. So pretty much what we, we help our customers to understand their social data and provide the right insights to act on and instantly to act on instantly, and I think that's a very important uh, uh, part of it. I'm Meredith Stevens. I'm the Director of Digital Strategy at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, a contractor to the Beef Checkoff. Um, and what we're really focused on in, in my role specifically is thinking about how we use digital to reach our different target audiences. So thinking about all the different social media platforms, what makes sense for us as Beef It's What's For Dinner as our consumer-facing brand, and then thinking about our end user, how they're using technology and helping our target audiences like retailers and food service operators use social media too. Hey, and I'm Kimberly Mackey, and I'm with Bright House Networks. Bright House Networks is a US-based, um, privately held uh, cable telecommunications firm. So we uh, provide broadband, TV, um, as well as uh, phone uh, to over 2.5 million customers. We're um, basically uh, very integrated. I, I head up corporate communications, public relations, which includes 
uh, not only the brand reputation management, traditional you know, PR and social, but also I'm over our strategic engagement in community relations throughout the uh, country in our multiple um, local, uh, local areas. And so uh, what we are trying to do is to ensure that uh, all of our metrics tie together, but also in a social engagement, we're talking about digital content, that our content is fully integrated, whether that's on our corporate blog or um, any of our social channels. We also have, have a very high customer engagement in digital, and so we do a lot of private messaging um, through multiple channels on social, and we monitor all of our, uh, our content from a customer forum perspective, too, which are kind of your high-tech users. So we've got really broad kind of uh, more what I would call sort of more the entertainment side of the engagement, but then we also have customers that have issues or problems and crisis. So there's a lot of engagement uh, going on across the whole company, and we're pretty much at the center of all of it. it kind of all reports into us. Okay. So to Thomas's question, then, and perhaps I'll go to Christoph first because this is something that I'm hearing um, more and more. I've heard um, uh, allegedly 60% of conversations online are happening in in private areas and dark and deep deep sites as well. What are your client base saying to you about that, and what's your thinking on on on, on how to, you know, what can we do about that? Yeah, I, and I think I would take this broader to, to talk about in general customer experience because uh, on one side we have yeah private networks, but on the other side we have as well closed forums uh, for support, for example, for uh, technology companies. We have on the other side call centers where people are, where companies are interacting with their customers. We have on the other side email. We have all different uh, um, uh, channels that are as well private. So it's a matter, of course, in this way to, that, the, that, that the brands on their own, they give, they give control on that data to external providers. And if they don't want to, uh, to give that, it's as well for a matter of brands on having a real-time picture on what is going on about uh, uh, their brand. So it's technology that needs to be, uh, in this case, in-house. And then it's a matter of, OK, but what type of services can be built on top of those, uh, uh, techno uh, on, on top of those technologies? Because what we see is that, of course, the brands, they don't, they are not, they, they don't have the resources afterwards to do deep analytics to, to get an external view on, 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 what is, on, on what does it mean, all types of consulting services that are related um, uh, to this customer experience or integrated uh, communication, uh, all, all types of research services that, uh, that, are, that are put on, on, on top of that. So I see really the, 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 the private uh, social networks, it's more like an, like an internal channel that uh, brands need to be in control of. Yeah. Because what, what we see, I, I don't think that the Snapchat has a data strategy to provide data to third parties. No. And then, of course, they're, they're private areas of the more public channels, which we just can't get to. And I, I wonder whether we just have to come to terms with the fact that some conversations and some content has always been private, and we just have to deal with that. That's, you know, so what? And if you want to know what your users are thinking, then you can always do market research. It doesn't have to come through... Um, through, through social analytics. Can I just add something to Please, it? Meredith, yes. Um, I think some of that pressure comes from being a, an advertising partner with some of these organizations, so having a paid to kind of back what you're doing on social. So Facebook's a really good example that just recently has started to um, open up some of that private data to brand partners who are have a paid support as part of that platform. And so I think some of it is probably the brand putting pressure on these social media platforms, but also accepting that some things, just like open rates on email, you, it, you can see the preview screen and that doesn't count as an open rate. So you know that the data is only going to be as limiting as what you have available and you just kind of have to accept that too. Yeah. And perhaps another part to Thomas's question um, might be about the, the validity of integrating traditional media monitoring and analytics with vast quantities of social um, monitoring and analytics. So uh, again, Chris, I'll go to you first. Your thoughts on that, and then perhaps, um, ladies, if you could explain how, how you're coping with that. And are you finding that social's drowning out the mainstream media? What, what are you doing to deal with those problems? Yeah. So when we work with customers, we have four main uh, types of customers. So we work with PR corporate communication, we work with marketing, we work with market research, and we work with IT innovation. With a big trend on IT innovation that take control of at least the technology and then provide these two different departments where corporate communication gets access to the platform for 
doing uh, an, a global issue management uh, a system for having media monitoring, having media analytics in-house, whereas on the other side as well, IT Innovation takes care of integrating the data then, for example, with web analytics, integrating it with advertising and integrate it with all the other channels that we just, uh, uh, where we just uh, um, uh, um, mentioned before. So, I see that there's a lot of potential of integrating measurement, integrating everything uh, that the AMEC members as well provide into other uh, departments. But what we see uh, that it is pretty difficult to talk from, to go from corporate communication for public relations into different other departments because it's a completely different uh, selling process. Because in order to sell to IT innovation, it's a software sale and it's not a service uh, sale. Yeah. So, ladies, perhaps to, to you then. So this this. This concept of the volume of content in traditional media is always going to be much lower than the volume of content in social media. How are you dealing with that in your measurement programs and your, the way that you report to the business and the way that you get insights from, from this? Are you looking at them separately or are you integrating them together? Where's the focus of the work that you're doing on that? I mean, we, we integrate it. So we look at the content based on who the target audience is. So we'll have different audiences and thinking about that messaging overall. And the, all of the traditional media versus the social media, it's all a part of the overall strategy that we implement from an integrated standpoint. And that's also the approach we take for measurement so that our measurement platforms are very much integrated because each individual program, whether it be traditional or whether it be social or digital, stand alone, they're not as effective. They have to be put into the larger context of an integrated strategy. And so that's where we take that strategy and also implement it into our measurement. And I would just add that uh, we're actually in the middle of changing all of our metrics and how we're presenting them to our senior management. So uh, every month when we meet with our CEO, every other department has these very um, brief charts and graphs and I walk in and I've got, in fact I was just talking with um, <laughs> with a woman from Southwest Airlines yesterday uh, about how you know you walk in there and you've got like almost jazz hands going on because you've got to, you want to show all the content that you've had and you, um, so we've got multiple reports that we do and I want my reports to look more like everybody else in the room rather than just um, the sizzle reel and the, and the uh, beautiful content. So uh, we do integrate it. Uh, it was on many pages before, but now we're working with Ketchum and we're pulling it into a, uh, a shorter report that actually um, in interlays everything together. And so we also, uh, this is maybe a little off topic, but similar part of that is we also went uh, through with our research, our marketing research uh, group, and we've looked at uh, the CTI, you know, the consumer brand, um, the consumer trust in tracks, uh, index, our um, brand tracker, uh, our NPS scores, um, focus groups. So we've tried to look at everything that's being done for the company and for the business and see how we're actually going to tie all these things back together. So we actually, um, at this conference, I got my first um, my first read on that report, and uh, so we're making some You're changes happy. now. Yeah. I think it's an important point you make as well about um, all of us need to consider this, that we shouldn't just produce a report for our clients, but it's about producing the right report for the right person at the client. And there may be three or four different stakeholders that need different lengths, different styles of reports, and we should, we should give thought to that. You said something interesting, though, Kimberly, about um, you're just changing all your metrics. Mm -hmm. So what, well, what happened and, and, and why and, and what are we moving towards? Well, it's, it's really it's just more about uh, me wanting to talk the same language of the rest. Now, I, if I'm talking to others in the uh, business where we actually do uh, presentations to, uh, throughout the country to many of our groups, uh, they really like to see the content. They don't want to just see a dashboard. That doesn't, it's not as meaningful. But when I'm speaking to our CEO, I have literally 10 minutes to give my report and so that's why I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to change it. I didn't think it was a very effective way to show the outcomes. Uh, we we do deal with everything from um, high crisis issues on a, on a very regular basis to very uh, simple things like we own news channels and, uh, and sports channels and we want the customer engagement. All of that goes through my team. It's a, it's a really large volume of content and you want to show that there's you know, some sort of an KPI outcome. snap report for the, yeah. for the CEO team. And Meredith made an interesting point about target audiences. And yesterday we were listening to uh, Professor McNamara talking about 
um, that communication's a two-way thing and that actually we, all of us as communications professionals are making the mistake of just broadcasting messages and not really um, genuinely listening. And what we want to be doing, of course, is having a conversation with our key target audience. Um, and this got me thinking, particularly in light of the UK uh, election where there was a, a, what, what turned out to be a bit of a shock result, particularly when you looked at the social media analytics, which um, had suggested that the Labour Party was, 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 was dominated. Of course, what had gone wrong was that people had taken their eye off the ball and just substituted Twitter conversation for a representative sample of the UK population, which it clearly wasn't. How do you define and zoom in on a target audience in social media? So we use a couple different platforms. Um, from our just more proactive storytelling and, and listening, uh, we use Sprinkler actually, um, to help monitor that community. I actually think social media provides a huge opportunity. It's probably one of the best channels to use from communication that allows the two-way dialogue um, if you're doing it correctly. And so we will use Sprinkler to help elevate some of that because the conversations and the platforms we're on, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, there's a lot of different platforms. So our community manager will use Sprinkler to kind of help assist in making sure that we're having those, those conversations. So I would say having a third party vendor to help you manage all those conversations or you know, even TweetDeck on Twitter is something that can be quite useful just to keep everything in line with what the conversation is. So social listening, without social listening, you really can't be effective on social media. Is, is my kind yeah. of thought. So you have to have both in order to make sure that you're building. Building the community is one thing. Continuing and maintaining the community and having that dialogue is what's gonna amplify your overall message and build those brand ambassadors that are gonna speak on your behalf and tell the world on their own social platforms how much they love your product. Right. Well, it, oh. Yeah, I was gonna ask to and, come to you, Kimberly, next from a, from a business to business point of view, is there a difference? And is there a place for market research where we know that these people are our potential purchasers of our service and that we go out and ask them what what channels do they use most and then feed that information back I mean, how does it how does it work for well, actually you I, I was gonna um, add something sim sim similar but not the exact same question you're ask asking but um, another thing that we do with our um, with our tool is we monitor heavily our, what our competition is doing so uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most people would do that but I just wanted to mention that because uh, we're in a highly competitive uh, marketplace and so we um, we definitely delve into what's going on in social uh, you you can actually uh, jump in and start interacting with their customers by doing uh, that. We don't we don't hijack that. Uh, we feel that um, we want to have an authentic experience first to bring them over. But if we um, if we wanted to, we could we could do more of that. So, so. so perhaps enlighten us with how you use that information. Once you see what the competitors are doing, perhaps you see their share of voice, you see what they're talking about. Then what? What's the uh, outcome? Well, What's the so what? Yeah, some sometimes we instant message. It depends on if it's a if it's a care issue, if it if it has to do with like technology or or them being unhappy. We sometimes will um, direct message. Um, otherwise, uh, we might we might try to reach them in other ways through some of our other channels. I was trying to think of a good example, but I can't think of a good example immediately right now. Okay, we had I had we had for example one example. It was the logistic company that were tracking. Um, really where the different packages, the, the people that are unhappy uh, because the package was uh, was delivered too, too late and so oh, forth, and okay. they were engaging directly then with those people to say, oh, let's try our services. It, it, we, we give you the, the safety that it gets delivered within 24 uh, yeah. hours, for example. Oh, and another thing, this is kind of small, but um, it actually really works, is uh, sort of those surprise and delights, like on mm -hmm. Facebook. We'll watch who, who likes certain content. Of course, we have uh, we have relationships with all of the channels we carry. And so if we find out, you know, right now we're in the Stanley Cup playoffs and uh, we had a bunch of Tampa Bay Lightning uh, gear, we actually uh, identified customers that were already uh, big fans. And so we, we did that through um, reaching out, you know, silently and then surprising them. And, and, and you both work we do a with lot of that, Ketchum, yeah. I believe. Is that, that's a, that's yeah. right. And I know, Meredith, you were talking that you'd work with um, Don Bartholomew yesterday, uh -huh. and uh, I remember Don two years ago talking about um, the value of engagement in terms of a like, and saying that he'd, some research he had showed that 65% of uh, people that like your page have already bought your product. Mm. So 
that led me to think about the value of engagement. Should we, should we prioritize some metrics over, over uh, others with, with, when we look at engagement? Do some have more value? How do you, how do you, how do you define engagement? How do you uh, measure engagement at your organizations? Well, I, yeah. oh, go ahead. Uh, well, I will say one thing that's important to our business, and it's, it's just the gold standard, is everybody tracks NPS. So our operations people are uh, metriced on their NPS scores, and uh, so we always try to tie back to NPS as well. And so I think that's, that's a big one for us. Is everybody familiar with N uh, NPS and Net Promoter Score? score? Uh, even our community relations, uh, we do, we do uh, surveys every uh, year to track back whether or not our community relations are actually making a difference in the buying decision. Of course, NPS only is a likely to recommend, not an actual purchase. That's the, you know, that's the difference. But yeah, we, um, it's kind of per channel. I would say in order of priority. So something like on Facebook that. Engagement-wise, somebody could like it, they could comment on it, they could share it. Shares are going to be your best. They're, that gets the extension of your content through their um, networks and their family and friends. So your sh to, for us, something like Facebook, shares are going to be much more of a significant metric on how well we're doing with content. Yeah. And then a comment is still that two-way engagement. A like is, is kind of a passive way to, to say that they like something, and probably that ties to the 65% of people who already are into your product is very, very non-committal, but just, oh, yeah, that's nice. But really, comments and shares, I think, are the more advanced type of engagement metric that you're looking for. And another example, and I think to your point, market research is huge. Consumer insights are tremendous um, so that we can make sure that we're tying into where our consumers are. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're missing that, you're missing the mark. Um, and one of the things that we had um, last year, so we had, you heard Michelle talk about how we took our whole advertising program digital. Um, and so we have a digital agency, and they found this nugget of information about this, what's called the second screen movement. And basically, if, you, if you're not familiar, it's now the consumer behavior is not just watching TV and that's it. You have your laptop up, you have your tablet, or you're on your phone. And what we discovered is that those folks, when they're in that second screen movement, they're looking at food cooking shows. They're on Food Network. They're looking at all of those different cooking shows. And they're tweeting and they're following the hashtag information on Twitter about those shows. So what we uncovered is that we could tap into that behavior and also engage with them while they're engaging with that show on that similar content that's still relevant. So when Food Network show is talking about cooking some sort of beef recipe, we can actually send them and engage them in that conversation through that social listening and be able to help them get uh, idea that inspiration they're getting from a Food Network show and actually getting a link to a recipe so that we're taking that to an action, yeah. an actionable piece of engagement and not just a kind of indirect or passive piece. Right. And, and of course we heard yesterday about no CEO wants to hear about the number of likes but they want to hear about the, the, the number of sales that we've, we've mm -hmm. helped to drive. So, and you, you talk about taking it to some, a piece of actionable information. Uh, we also heard from Alex Aiken uh, in the Evaluation Council about um, the work he's done to help move his government communicators from sending out stuff, which I think is a default of PR, I'm an ex-PR person myself, is that our, our default thing is we just start doing stuff, but to, 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 to move beyond that to um, properly planning what success looks like. So looking t again, t please, just to the ladies for this one, when you s please can you tell us a bit about how do you plan digital and social campaigns? Do you do, you do uh, on, on a time basis, do you do it on a campaign basis, um, and what what type of things would you define success as? Would it just go as far as how many likes and shares we want, or do you try and link that through further? Do you want to go first? Or? Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, so for us, we have an ongoing digital campaign that we'll do through the summer months. So for us, May through September is is grilling season in the U.S. Um, so we will have a digital campaign that will take place um, through that time frame. So that's kind of something that we know that we want to hit on every year. And so we'll look at a number of different metrics that will help us not just in the paid digital space, but also how are we carrying that through to our influencers. So we'll engage our influencers to also bring that. How are we engaging also our media relations outreach? So all of the different pieces that we have in our ecosystem will play a part in that. 
Um, something that we recently just launched is the protein challenge. So we uncovered with the consumer insights in, in the states at least, protein is big. There's a lot of products that are trying to get into the protein space and we're one of the lucky ones that actually has a significant amount of protein. Um, and so what we uncovered was that some sort of protein challenge that helped people, because consumers are always doing these plank challenges and these squat challenges and push-up challenges. So having something that revolves around that, that like and that inspiration and having a 30-day challenge. So we created this protein challenge that we took it beyond just social, also into digital. So we had the digital amplification. We had our influencers taking the challenge and encouraging their readers to take the challenge and then had all the different communications collateral or pieces that tied to our own properties as well. And that's one of the things that we've seen a huge explosion in something that is such an integrated campaign from all the different channels yeah. and how we're looking at not just social, not just digital, but also even our just earned or owned properties and how much more significant results we're seeing. And even with our State Beef Council partners, they're engaged in it, they love it, so they're behind it. They're additional stakeholders that are participating and, and promoting it. So it's it's been a kind of a rallying cry for um, beef, but also for protein and why protein is important in a healthy lifestyle. And, and you tried? Yeah, so I would say we do, uh, we do very similar um, on big issues like that, but we also, every quarter, uh, because because we're obviously a part of the business, um, that's where we try we do very uh, what I would call um, they're integrated campaigns, but some of them are very micro uh, micro level. I'll give you an example uh, when we were going through our digital conversion. Um, with all of our systems, basically we found that there was not this, people just didn't have this compelling reason to come in and switch out their converter box, okay? And so uh, what was going to happen is you were gonna lose channels and uh, some, some devices wouldn't work at all if you didn't have them. But you know, we kept saying it and saying it and press releases and everything was going out. And uh, yes, we'd put some stuff on social, uh, on multiple channels, but when we started, we used a, a targeted Facebook campaign. We matched up our zip codes with the zip codes that we're actually going to be uh, turning over, and we did some paid. And that was the highest success yeah. that we had in bringing people to you know, get their, um, their, con their uh, d digital converters changed out. So we have, um, we have business products. Like I said, we have channels. Plus, we have uh, residential products. So our calendar, really, when we do integrated communication campaigns, it really, every quarter, they change because launch dates move and things like that. But yeah. we also have big things uh, that are okay. one size fits all that are more um, what I could consider yeah. more PR campaigns. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, so changing um, gear now, um, we uh, have heard that the research shows that we're spending a lot of time amongst our membership, developing new platforms, um, dealing with getting the data, storing the data. Christoph, you launched TalkWalker how many years ago? You're the founder of the company. Yeah, we started five years ago. Five years ago, and um, obviously you've grown very fast. Um, you're pulling in vast amounts of data. What have been the real challenges, and what, what, what tips and lessons can you share uh, with the membership in terms of um, what they need to be thinking about to, to create a successful uh, workflow like that? <coughs> I think the first question is uh, am I a technology company or am I an, uh, an analytics provider or a service provider uh, in the end? Uh, because uh, it's a complete different business uh, and uh, uh, we, we see some people doing both, uh, some people focusing on the technology, some uh, people focusing on, this, on the services. But the most successful that we encountered is those that focus on really one of them and do it really at 100% or 200%. And on the long term, this is like the, the best strategy. That's from our, from our side what we, what we, have, uh, what we have seen. Um, beside that, I think another, another challenge was of, of course, uh, in talking the same language, because as well as we're addressing different types of customers, because we, t we mostly, when we sell to customers, we, t we talk about the hub and spoke model. So we have like digital, uh, in the beginning it was social teams, now those social teams moving over into digital teams that are managing social and digital, and then delivering to different uh, uh, other uh, departments. And the, the language and the vocabulary changes from Months, I would even say from, one, from months to months. The metrics change from months to months. 
we talk about integrated communication, we talk about customer experience, we talk about big data, we, we talk about all of the different buzzwords, and then we talk about social media monitoring, social listening, and everybody says, oh, but there are 300 companies out there that do social listening. But social listening and social listening is two different pairs of shoes, and it's, in PR it's completely different than in uh, marketing. Mm -hmm. Tracking from now on into the future is something different than even market research, where they're going to go back for two years and find out what are the emotions linked to a brand. But it's always <laughs> under the same hat, which is called social listening, I think. So there, the big challenge is in terms of educating the, the market and pushing into a direction to say, okay, what is social uh, listening, for example? So, so looking to the future, there's a lot of talk. Certainly PR, we all know, is changing. Um, <clears throat> we've got Robert Phillips, who's the um, ex-boss of Edelman in, in Europe, writing a book called Trust Me, PR is Dead, uh, which has is, is got down a storm recently. Uh, we've got thought leaders like Philip Sheldrake talking about the rise of the influence professional and the end of PR as we know it, so that you, we're going to need to have multiple skills and disciplines. Uh, and it won't, there won't be this PR function as, as we know it at the moment. So as, as we all think to the future, what, what type of service do we need to be focusing on, perhaps for, for the, the world that we know at the moment, but whatever world it will be in, 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 in three to five years' time? What are, what's the panel's view on, on that? I think one thing I mentioned yesterday that we're struggling with from integrated measurement is not just the proactive side, but also the reactive side. So when you're involved in issues and crises, um, how do you measure the such a, an important, it's kind of like paying for insurance. You need to pay for insurance for when you need it. And so how do you evaluate or even communicate the ROI that's being the impact that's actually taking place when you have a crisis and measuring something that didn't happen? is I think the, one of the biggest challenges that we're facing, and that isn't just a strict PR thing, but it is a, an integrated piece because most likely now you're fighting those, those conversations online and social just as much as you might be in a, a media request that you get from a journalist who's doing a three-page story on something. So predictive analytics is meant to be the next big yeah. thing. Yeah. Do you think that social media monitoring and analytics can predict a crisis and avert it? And have you got an example of, of that? I think it can. Um, we, from a issues and reputation management side, we also use a third-party platform called Nuvi. And Nuvi is a very significant monitoring service that allows us to watch all those types of conversations based on keywords um, and elevate them based on the filtering and the categories that we have already predefined. It also allows us to bring context to it. So something that um, one of our farmers or ranchers might, might hear about in the news or they might see online and, and say, gosh, this is a big issue, this is a big problem, what are we doing about it? Having something like a platform that can help us evaluate the actual noise versus what we think is, is maybe a potential issue actually allows us to be smarter about how we respond. And sometimes you don't need to dedicate the resources to it um, depending on the context. So it might feel big, it might feel like a huge crisis, but then when you look at all of the data, when you look at the, the information that's at your hands and what really is happening socially and digitally, it's not, it doesn't qualify to that extreme level. So that's helped us both balance resources, but also expectations for what categories okay. need the best resources. Okay. So I'm very conscious of time, because uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm finding this fascinating, but I, I, I want to make sure that everyone in the room is included. So I'm going to throw it back to the floor. We've got, um, we've got three people who have been very open and honest about their programs and um, have agreed with me that they'll answer anything that we throw at them. So, so let's take another question. We've got Alistair Wheat um, here from Gorkana. Talk loud. I'm on again. Um, so we've heard a lot in the conference so far about paid, earned, and owned. And yesterday we saw in a couple of the presentations the acronym PESO. And I've seen the S in a number of places stand for shared. Um, yesterday it was actually being used to stand for social. And I'd be very interested in the panel and also uh, your views on this, Richard, on whether social should be seen as a category aside from paid, owned, and earned, or whether really social actually can be paid, earned, or owned and how you actually integrate it, whether you integrate it within that model or whether you, you treat it as a separate category on its own? I, quickly for me, I think that it was Don Bartholomew who 
uh, put a lot of effort behind the peso model. And from my time working with Don, uh, Don intended it to be shared. Now, I don't know whether yesterday's slides were misnamed <laughs> um, by whoever used them or whether they meant them as social. I certainly think that social can be uh, across, across all of them. That's my brief answer. You, you've I worked agree. with Don. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would say for me, S stands for shared. Um, I think right now in some of the examples of how shared is defined, social falls very well in that. But social is something that, and, and the pure definition of shared is that you can't control when those platforms change. So when Facebook several years ago was allowing brands to have pages, you could reach a large majority with, of your audience just by posting something and organically touch almost all of them. Now, because of the sheer size and also because they want a revenue model, um, they're restricting that because they want more money. So I think some of those, because you can't control them, Facebook changed their, changes their algorithm, they changed to a more revenue model stream you have to kind of go along with it, which is a shared platform. You can't control it. And so that's where it has infused paid and some of those other pieces of the ecosystem. Yeah. I, I, I would go with it's shared. But. Thank you. Yep. Do we have another question for the panel? We've got Jensen Wee from Microsoft at the, at the back here. I have a question for Kimberly. You, you've been talking about your MPS score. Do you guys look at MPS as a separate standalone metric, or do you integrate that with your the rest of your communications metric, so correlating the increase of uh, share of voice or sentiment with an increase in MPS score? So um, it's a good question, and we're actually starting to integrate it. So that's one of the things that we're working with with David Rockland right now. And uh, as far as the business operations, um, it is standalone and integrated, if that makes sense. We also use it for things like our customer forums, just to measure how effective our customer forums are. It's such, such a simple metric to, uh, to bring into play um, there as well. So we, we have like something like, I don't know, 36 customer forums uh, that we um, not only just listen, but we engage in on a regular basis. But does that answer your question? It is something that um, I don't think we've got the, uh, the integration on social perfected yet. And that's, um, I will say we're earlier in our measurement um, in our measurement rehaul, if you will, <laughs> than I think uh, you know Meredith is. So, I don't know if you another question. We've got one down here. Hi, Ben Levine from Ketchum. Um, just kind of really interested to hear uh, the panel's thoughts on the dynamic between uh, paid and earned and shared within social and adapting the peso model, kind of considering that you know a lot of organic content, only about 1% to 2% of your audience is ever going to see that. So you talk a little bit about, one, how paid is helping to ensure that the right content is reaching your audience, and then how you're integrating the measures between um, paid and uh, earned and shared. Um, I, okay, so I'll, I'll start because we're st <laughs> we're in the early stages of that. But I will say, um, when we're talking about earned, also, I this is just something I always want to keep in mind. It really b depends on who you're talking to in the company. Our CEO has very specific feelings about what he thinks is like a really good um, earned story or an earned um, post, how much it's been shared, all that stuff. So is, I think that's really, um, this might not be everybody's answer, but for me internally, when I'm having those discussions, I sometimes will change the report to, um, to who the audience is that I'm talking to. Does that make sense? And we are doing a lot more with paid. I will tell you, we, we really, our organic reach is not, I mean, it's, it's just not there anymore. And so we're doing a whole lot more with paid. And there's a wake up call again to all of us that we need to be looking at integrating that into our measurement. Yes, please. Yeah, um, I was quite stuck with your uh, affirmative um, uh, on the contextualization. Um, you said you, you, might, you might be quite sure to predict results uh, in putting up a, uh, texts uh, in, in taking the keywords out and then giving them a sense uh, and this sense gets a noise. Mm -hmm. um, it's the first time I hear that you really uh, are so affirmative. You have good results with that and, and uh, is it the noise that you hear growing or 
you can really say I'm, I'm further than most in saying uh, we are on the way. You have good results. I and mean, how? I, yeah, I, th I think, I definitely think it's a journey. So I wouldn't say that we've got it all figured out. I think the issues in crisis reputation part is a perfect example of that. Um, but what we've seen so far in using that kind of social listening to help us evaluate those issues and how it's actually being communicated online by those target audiences is starting to bring those insights and we're able to act on them. So we're seeing very good results thus far by using that kind of um, integration of, among the messaging and even having some paid dollars to put behind it to elevate it because when you're dealing with a crisis you also don't want to elevate that crisis or issue to people who aren't already talking about it. So I think it's a combination of those two but so far we have been seeing some great results, yes. So uh, I think it's, it's coming to time to wrap up, but I, I've got a, a, a question which I'm sure most of the audience will be interested in, and uh, I hope that you can be nice and transparent with it, which is budgets. Um, most of us sell to, to client organizations. Um, for many years, there used to be, uh, we had it mentioned yesterday, it was run by PR Week, it was called the Proof Campaign. And the Proof Campaign was to get PRs and communicators to spend 10% of their uh, comms budget on, on measuring uh, how effective their work had been. And the, uh, the truth from my experience was it was more like one or 2% was what was actually spent, if anything at all. And I'm talking about going back you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, what percentage of your social media budget are you prepared to spend on your monitoring and analytics service? Oh, I think we spend more than 10%, actually. Um, well, well beyond 10%. If, I mean, when you're talking about um, analytics, your analytics in real time are what in, are, but maybe you're talking about after the fact. Um, am I misunderstanding the question? Because we have real time analytics and yeah. engagement. If yeah. we didn't have that, we wouldn't be able to do our jobs. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a huge chunk of what we're spending, actually. Yeah, I mean, I think we're probably, I, I don't know the exact number. My, the budgets are split across our various program areas. So yeah. I'm like a kid that needs an allowance to spend money um, going to my to audience leads. But I will say that. Um, we have, to one of the earlier points, we've started to take a lot more in-house because we are having to prioritize how we use our agencies mm -hmm. and what is more capable for us to take on versus what is more important for them to take on. So I, I would say it's probably, time-wise, it's much more. Budget-wise, we're having to prioritize because resources are really and tight. And of course, time is money, though. Yes, yes. So that's, right. that's always one of the issues. When people talk about low cost and no uh, cost, and I would, I would just add, and this is just my, me anecdotally, we, we have um, most of our content, we don't have an agency to do like our press releases and our content because um, it, it's, we've actually tried agencies before they haven't, it hasn't been, hasn't been as good of an experience with the type of content and ours changes so rapidly and quickly. And um, anyway, long story short, uh, I, for example, am much more willing to spend money on measurement and analytics than I am on actually content um, creation. That's just me, uh, because it really is, the proof is in the pudding for your CEO, that's who your audience is, that's who you've got to make sure is giving you, you know, the money um, to do what you need and the staff so that's, that's just my take. And on that very positive note, I think it's a, it's a great time for us to, to wrap up. So I'd like to thank Christoph, um, Meredith, and, and uh, Kimberly for their time. Thank the audience. Um,